introduce you Professor David Sturia from EPFL Switzerland. I think everybody knows him very well and uh, he has supported our society since several years ago. He was the former chair of the IDF several years ago. And, he, and I discovered yesterday that he changed the name from uh, Data Fusion uh, Technical Committee to IDF. So it's thanks to him if we have this name. I hope you like it. And uh, okay, for uh, the ones who don't know him very well, I will introduce him. I have some notes here. I don't want. Don't be shocked. Davis completed his PhD at the University of Lausanne, Switzerland, when he studied uh, kernel media for hyperspectral satellite data. He then traveled the world as a postdoc, first at the University of Valencia, then at the uh, University of Colorado Boulder, and finally back to EPFL. In 2014, uh, he became assistant professor at the University of Zurich, and in 2017, he moved to Wageningen University in the Netherlands, where he was chair of the Geoinformation Science and Remote Sensing Laboratory. Since September 2020, he's back to EPFL, where he leads the Environmental Computational Science and Earth Observation Laboratory in Sion. There, he studies the Earth from above with machine learning and computer vision. Great, a lot of experience. The, this, this lesson is entitled Visual, Vision Language Models in Remote Sensing. So just a very few words and then I, I give you the, the floor. You can find in this title the word language. When you see the word language, this word is quite important because language uh, gives us the opportunity to communicate with others and to get information from the world. So this, this word is very important. To use language, to uh, interact uh, through language in Earth observation, so could make a remote sensing image more accessible to everybody. So this is a very good and uh, a, a great goal that we want to obtain in this way. And, but to do this, we have to study. We have to study new models, uh, new models that uh, jointly use text and image. In this lesson, Davis will introduce us some, some basic concepts about uh, language models and the uh, connection with the remote sensing. I think it's enough for an no, introduction. I don't have to give an introduction anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Davis, it's time to start. The floor is yours. Okay, good morning, everybody. How are you? In this talk, you, you're allowed to talk, and you will talk, just that you know. Did you download the stuff? Everybody who didn't? Raise your hand and be shamed. No? Okay, if you haven't, it's time to do it, because we will need it. Okay, uh, okay it was a pleasure to meet you. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks, Gemini coming and um, yeah we have a few hours together and the idea is to walk you through something that maybe you have heard of and you don't know much about I hope uh, so vision language models and uh, I hope you'll have a good time if you don't I'm sorry <laughs> but before starting um, just as a warm-up I wanted to show something else This. It's a wonderful word page, empty. I wanted to know from you, because I, I couldn't be, make it the first day, and I wanted to know from you, basically, what did you learn in this school so far? And just please feel free to speak up. I will not continue until you speak. Yes, please. Methods for data fusion. All right. I will write it down. Anything else? 
something else. What did you bring home from the school before my course? Then we will repeat something. Come on, don't be shy. It's the morning for everybody, and I need you awake. Explain about machine learning, something in particular you like. Smells like Mike Michel thought, right? Yeah. Michel, are you here? Here you are. It's good to see you. <laughs> so some self-supervised learning, maybe? Constructive learning. Sorry? Constructive learning. Constructive learning. Nice. So I'll put it like this. Contrastive learning. That's good. That's good. Oh, come on, I didn't think you were so shy. You, tra you traveled the world for this school. So. Can you speak a bit louder? I can hear you. Data statistics are important. So true. And you had great food as well, didn't you? I heard you had a wild night out. No? That's also part of it, you know? Very well, very well. OK, I'll stop bothering you. But just remember, you can step in any time in, in the course. It's fine. So before we really, really start, I can ask you a last thing to open the notebook, if you have it. And then just, you know, run the two first lines, OK? Because if you haven't done it before, this can take a few minutes. So it takes just a few seconds for me, because I've done it before. But if you haven't, it could take a few minutes. All right? Good. Nice, nice. So now, now I'm ready to start. Are you? Yeah. Come, come on. All right, let's get started. So indeed, the, this little gentle introduction was meant for me to make sure that what I wrote here was true. Right? I had the impression that given the respected and illustrious colleagues uh, that are here in the summer school, um, you will master a bunch of things before starting this course. So you know, semantic segmentation, semantic segmentation, I will go here. Semantic segmentation will be like. Piece of cake for you, data fusion, SAR, thanks to Florence, and, and explainable AI, thanks to Rivana, and self-supervised stuff. So you will know all of this already, which put me in a kind of a difficult situation. It's always difficult to be the last person speaking, because all the cool stuff has already been said, right? So I had to find something that was sufficiently different from the other speakers in order not to bore you to death by repeating something you already know. So the idea was that I decide to try something different, right? So we want to finish in style. It's going to be a tiny little different talk with respect to what you had. It's going to be not so much traditional remote sensing. And, um, and that's, that's why I chose to do that. I don't know if you know this place. You probably won't, because it's a very small town in Switzerland, where I work, actually. It's called Sion, and it's a beautiful place. It's not New York, but it has a lot to offer. And uh, you know, you've been looking at that for a little while, and there are things that are running through your head, OK? Things that you might want to know, things that you might want to process. But I guess from person to person, they are very different. Can, 
What are you thinking about when you see this? My policy is not to continue until you talk, so just be aware of that. I have time. Multiple feature, oh, you go immediately on the tech stuff, yeah. So you see this image and you think of multiple features. Interesting, okay. What else? If you were coming to Sion for the summer school, what you, would you want to know? Much greener vegetation. Aha, okay, you will be interested in studying vegetation, good, right? How green is that, where you can grow stuff, yes? The carbon extent. Oh, yeah, it's very scientific questions. Yeah, good. Sorry? It was, it was captured on clear skies. It's, it's an aerial image. It's much easier to be closer to the ground. Yeah. OK, well, I mean, there are many, many things that you want to know. Uh, maybe you want to, to find areas that have a similar lake as, as this one. You know, you like to swim, and you see this image like, oh, this is cool, and it reminds me of this place where, when I was younger, but where was that? That could be a question that you could have. Or maybe you like to grow apricots, you are into agriculture like Rivana, then uh, you want to know where to grow apricots. You need some specific, you know, sun conditions, soil conditions, and things like that. Or maybe, you know, you work in, in, in the economy, in the tourism sector, and you want to write down a pamphlet, so an information sheet about this, uh, this city, and uh, you don't know where to start, right? But this image can help you because you already know that there's a nice lake, you know that you know, it's a green place with a lot of forest and things like that. So you see, very different things, but all things that we can express with language, all right? So that's why I wanted to talk about language today. And uh, if we convert all these questions into you know, uh, technical terms. The first could be like image retrieval. So you know this image of the lake and you want to find similar images somewhere else for your next holiday, for example. Or you want to look in your, in your photo collection on your computer. You, have, you must have like 20,000 images on your computer and to find that what image will involve a lot of scrolling. So maybe you want to, you know, automatize that. Or maybe the, the problem of apricots is, uh, you know, it's like crop detection problem, but it's a very specific crop, and you probably don't have a model for that. So label efficient things are one way. Maybe you want to, you know, use something generic, foundational. <laughs> and finally, uh, the pamphlet story was that you want to actually generate text from the image. So a description of the image made of text, because everybody understands text, okay? It's like a common dictionary for everybody. So remember, Language is, in a way, a universal interface. If you, if you look at these three views, so this is a satellite view, this is a view from the ground, and this is a sketch. I mean, you, we all agree that they all point to the same concept, right? And this concept is, when you express this in text, the same, independently of the different views you are looking at, okay? So it's a kind of a universal interface, okay? It's something that helps you describe the word, even if you're not a specialist. And this is what I want to carry as a message today, and uh, that if you want to go multimodal, uh, remain semantic, then language is probably a way to achieve all that. But of course, to, to connect this, this guy with this guy here, we need a set of methodologies, eh? that's why we're here, image analysis and data fusion. And uh, the methods I want to talk about today are from the NLP community, which stands for Natural Language Processing. So it's maybe something you know already. Who, who, has, who has experience in NLP in the room? One, two, okay, two is good. Uh, for the others, open bar, I can say whatever I want. <laughs> no, sorry. Very good. Um, so yeah, so this is why I decided to, to move to that. Even though it's not gonna be a lot of satellite images today, I hope you can bring something home that maybe you can apply in your everyday business. So the first part will be so what, what they call a gentle detour in the NLP domain. So we will go through different families of models and try to make them 
a little bit less mysterious. Uh, of course, you will not be NLP experts after that. At, uh, at EPFL in my university, there are like three courses to get to that level, full semester. So we get an overview, that's it. And in the second part, still we are in a remote sensing summer school, so I'll show you a couple of things that we did in that direction, like connecting language and remote sensing. I hope I can go through the whole thing. Uh, let's see, but we have all afternoon, just in case. <laughs> who has an early flight? Or the evening, for those who are around in the evening. Anyway, anyway, okay, so part one. Fasten your seatbelt, we are going through a gentle introduction language models. Are you ready? Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, good. So what is a language model? First thing, important. So a language model is a probabilistic model of natural language. The probabilistic part is, is pretty important. Like you want, as for you know, all the deep learning models we've been seeing, you want to express the probability of something related to something else, okay? And in our case, this something and this something else are words, okay? So we want to estimate the probability of a given word appearing after some other words, okay? And this model, you usually train them using words. Yeah? And where are the words? And I know it's on the slides, but... All over the place, over the internet, yes. So, I mean, you have potentially infinite training data because you have all of the internet there to learn from, okay? So, again, the language model, mo most, I mean, it's not the only thing, but mo a lot of language models, what they do is that they predict the next word given the words that have already been observed, okay? So, there is one thing that is important. We're talking about machine learning models. It is not linguistics, okay? There is no notion of grammar implicitly. A language model will predict based on probabilities and probabilities alone. So at the end, it will mimic how people write. It will not mimic a grammatical structure as you have been studied at school, okay? It will just look at a bunch of text and reproduce what it has seen, like every machine learning model. You look at your training set and you reproduce it. You go out of domain, it doesn't work, okay? So since the domain, one second, since the domain is so big because of the entirety of internet, it goes pretty well, but it's not perfect. Yes? I'm just curious if you suggest the Everything exists. There are models that are multi-language, trained on multi-languages. There are language-specific models. Those that we use are usually English-specific. English yeah, but there are versions for French. Uh, then the more niche the language, the more difficult to find a specific model. But I've seen models handling 100 languages, yeah. Thanks. Good, so, for example, if I put this, you say? Sleep, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> I shall sleep, that's your message. You, you shall sleep, okay. Anyone else? Oh my God, this, thank you, thank you, thank you, yes. Do you know who this guy is? Yeah, so what is the quote? You shall confess, not pass, you shall not pass, exactly, yeah. So, I know it's a, it's a kind of a fun example. You, you want Gandalf for the picture? There you go. Okay, I know, I know it's, a kind of a, it's a kind of a fun example, but in the end, what have you done? We are related these two words, their appearance, to a corpus of text, and you have taken the maximum probability according to your experience. And since we are all, in a way or another, Lord of the Rings geeks, I mean, I hope you are, I am, when you see you shall, apart from you need to sleep, of course. Um, <laughs> everybody else thought you shall not pass with the big, the big thing against the Balrog in Moria. Very well, very well. So I think this example says it all. Now, um, 
So you, you can do a bunch of things with natural language pro uh, processing. So for example, you can analyze sentiments, which is very romantic, but it actually means that given a text, you can relate if it's positively or negatively connotated, if it hates speech, if it's you know, encouraging, or these kind of things. It can help chatbots answer your questions. I guess you have used ChatGPT, so you know what I'm talking about. It can uh, predict your text when you write an email. If you have a Gmail account, you have noticed that when you start typing, some possibilities appear. That's a, that's a language model, and so on and so forth. Eh? You, can, you can keep going like that. So, First break, uh, and we will go on the notebook for a second. And I want to show you what I mean, and then we continue. So I hope you have the, the notebook open. If you don't, just look here, and it also works. All right, so you, you have executed the two first lines, so we can go to our introduction to NLP. Then you can read everything at home. Eh? We, we really try to make it as self-consistent as possible. Uh, but basically, the thing that I want to show you, it's how it works if you're very lazy and you want to use Hugging Face, uh, where you have a bunch of uh, NLP models there. Basically, the thing that you need to do is to import the pipeline, okay? So you basically have the Hugging Face uh, pipeline, so you, you basically you, you run this part, so it's gonna take a little, a little moment, but the thing that is happening it's basically that you will import what they call a pipeline, which is basically a model fully trained, ready to go, for a certain type of problem, okay? So in this case, we are, we are um, how to say that? We are um, choosing among all the models in the pipeline, a model for sentiment analysis, so the first one we were talking about, and we are giving a sentence with, within the classifier called I love remote sensing, okay? I love remote sensing is obviously Thumb up or thumb down? Just show me your thumb. Thumb up, of course, is positively correlated. So you can see that the label is positive because this is a kind of an arc max of a, of, on a score. Eh? And your score is 99%. Yes? Is the remote sensing for the problem of the one score? Uh, yes. So here, if you change this by H, for example, up, and we run it again. Then I hate it, remote sensing, negative 98%. Okay? So the model is doing what, what it should do. This is great. And later on, we see how, how we do it. That's just to give you an idea of how it is working. Um, I just, I mean, you can try, but I don't know what this is going to. Of course. Yes. It's still a negative connotation. It's not more, that language model is not a moral entity. It will just look at the words and predict. So the word hate is strongly negatively correlated. So it will predict. The, there is no notion of, uh, of, of uh, reasoning or, or, or grammar in all this. So it's analyzing words and then giving you an answer, maximizing the probability of a classifier. The classifier is a binary classifier saying positive one, negative zero. Oh, so if we think, if well, I think I hate remote sensing, it's still very hard. Hi, sorry, I thought it would go down, but it didn't. Anyway, a second thing you can do is generate text, okay? And generate text uh, is, a, is a tricky thing, and I basically, I put this to show you basically how language models can go wrong, okay? And in this case, we are using a pipeline that is text generation, and uh, we ask the model to generate text that continues this sentence, okay? So satellites are amazing because. So if you run it, I mean, this is already run, so I'll just keep it. So it will write, satellites are amazing because they have been designed to ensure accuracy so that we're not just bu building rockets, we're doing the same thing. It's kind of like trying to make baseball pitch like a baseball bat, and we're supposed blah, 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 blah. So you see, this specific model, it's generating text one word at a time, always looking at what was before, and at some point, it kind of loses the notion of remote sensing because this specific model, the way I said it, doesn't have a lot of memory behind, and also, you know, sometimes it just doesn't do what you want. 
here, I, I, tried, I tried to generate more sentences. And uh, it's a way to show you the, the different parameters you can control. So for example, you can provide the maximum length of the sentence that you're generating and the number of sentences that you're generating. And then, for example, I put in this course about satellite imaging, we will learn how to look at a comment and understand how it works. So it didn't really understand what we are doing here, but that's fine because most articles about satellite imaging out of the internet are about the outside space. So it assumes that we are talking about outside space because it is maximizing a certain probability for this, okay? Or how to get a better understanding of satellite data from satellite. This talk is from MIT. <laughs> I wish, but actually, uh, no. <laughs> but again, probably there is a lot of astrophysics in MIT and by generating, it goes that way, and so on and so forth. So again, this is a way to show you that language models are not perfect, and they have no notion of me here talking at this moment. They just try to predict a sense that makes sense in terms of appearance of words. OK? Cool. And we stop here for the first demo. You can play with it. Uh, as you like, you can change the sentences, you can have fun. Hop. Good. Are you still with me? It's interesting? Yeah? Thumb up. Sentiment? Positive? <laughs> cool. <laughs> nice. Uh, so let's go on the families of language models. So there are many, many, many models around. And I decided to like, summarize that onto three big groups. Uh, I will go very quickly on the first, a, a little bit, I will stop a little bit on the second and spend some, quite some time on the third, okay? Because I know everybody's <laughs> excited about transformers. And I mean, are you? Yeah, you should, you should, yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, but the statistical models are basically what made NLP a thing. So even though oh, you're young and, and, and energetic and you want to jump immediately to transformer, I will force you to know what the n-gram model is. Because I'm like that, I'm terrible. Yeah. So what is an uh, n-gram model? n-gram model is how people were doing NLP, let's say, five to 10 years ago. And it, there, there's still a bunch of people were using that, but uh, I will say that statistical models were big until recurrent nets, then they went together, and now that there are transformers, everything else disappeared. But basically, what are we trying to do? We are trying to model statistically the occurrence of words in sentences, okay? So basically, you want to, I always forget that in the screen the pointer doesn't work. You want to, to get the probability of a certain sequence of words, okay? And this is quite a combinatorial problem if you think about it, because it's the joint probability of all the words occurring together, okay? And you want to really approximate them in order to predict what is the next word as a maximum probability problem, okay? You do maximum likelihood in the end. And uh, to limit the computational insanity of this, people has been uh, reducing the memory of, what, uh, of the length of the sequence you are looking at, okay? So for example, the simplest that you can get is called a one gram, okay? Gram is a, is a, a word, okay? So in a one gram, you basically predict the, the probability of a, of a word by looking at the word itself, okay? So it's basically the, 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 the product of the probabilities of each word in the sentence. You just look them at one by one. It's like if you're doing pixel classification without looking at the spatial context, in a way, okay? But if you do it like that, you basically miss out all the structure of the language. You're just telling me, yeah, cat is the most, uh, is the most uh, occurring word because I've seen these words in the sentence and they tend to, to occur together. The cool thing will, will be to say, oh, I want to predict cat because before there is an article and, uh, and the word before is followed and I am, a, I am a little cat and I like to follow mommy cat, okay? So you, you put some context into your, your modeling and to put context, you need to look at conditional probabilities, okay? So the two grams model, for example, models the probability of the sentence as the joint, pro the conditional probability of each word given the previous one, okay? 
So it's the probability of i given a certain feature representing the start of the sentence, then followed given the, the given cut, and the end of sentence given cut. If you have a three gram, then it's uh, follow given i and start of sentence and blah, 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 okay? So the larger the n gram, the, the more the model takes into account context of the sentence, okay? Good. So now, the story is that an n gram model for language to predict what is the probability of a word, uh, again, <laughs> what is the probability of a word occurring given all the words behind, basically boils down to the ratio of how many times these words occur together divided by how many times these words minus the one you want to predict occur together. Okay, it's a ratio and it gives you a probability and at the end you take the one with the highest number, no? Which means that you choose the word that has been seen the more often with the other words. Okay, do you see a problem with that? That's the first question, very good. So how do you want to calculate it? I mean, you need a corpus. So you take a bunch of sentences, you, you download Wikipedia, you have all the sentences, and you start to look for this word appearing together in an engram. But that, what does this imply? Test many, test many words, not many, all of them, and all their combinations, okay? This is the problem. So yeah, so that's problem two. Eh? This, uh, you need to store all possible combinations of sequences of length n. And depending on the size of your dictionary, which is a dictionary is all the words that are possible. So you take Wikipedia, you look at all the words that occur in Wikipedia, this is your dictionary. And then you can, uh, you can, you need to count how many times cut the swimming pool occur, cut the forest, cut the dog. Uh, in all the possible combinations. This is insane, if you think about it. And the second, thi uh, the second thing is that it also limits the memory you can have, because the larger the n-gram, the more complex the problem becomes. But sometimes, the logical connection to predict the next word is more than five words ago. Especially if you look at texts uh, that are complicated, the next word doesn't depend only on the previous one. If we take back the problem of the cat, where is it? I mean, to know that the anticipates the cat doesn't help you predicting cat. You need to have, to have a, at least two jumps because after an article, the only thing you know is it's gonna be a noun, but you don't know which one, okay? So if you, if you do a little bit of calculations, let's say that we want to predict uh, the probability of mat given the cat sat on the, the cat sat on the mat, that's kind of a tongue twister. You, but you need to first know how many times the cat sat on the mat appears in Wikipedia, divided by how many times the cat sat on appears on Wikipedia, okay? Now, if you have a size of 40,000, for example, which is a regular size in NLP, this means that if you're considering six words like this, you have 40,000 to the power of six of combinations. It's a lot of combinations. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's why the, the, the engram model, you know, was very strong before uh, deep learning, and there were a lot of tricks to make this digestible. But, you know, you are, you are dealing with a problem which is extremely complex, extremely big, and, we, where, and which is extremely sparse as well. Most entries are zero. M most combinations actually never. So there was a lot of research on, on spark signal, signal processing and things like that. Okay, this is everything I will tell about statistical models. And, you know, I say gentle introduction, no? so let's, let's stay gentle. Are you okay? Are you still alive? Good, how am I doing time-wise? I, I have the impression I'm very slow. Yes, I'm very slow. Uh, well, well, we'll get where we get. Huh? So now we, <coughs> now we enter the deep learning realm, so everybody's happy again. And uh, the second model I wanted to talk about, it's recurrent neural networks. Did you have recurrent neural networks in these three days? 
Just shake your head is enough, but please give me the information. No, no you didn't have recurrent neural networks. <laughs> Fair enough. You know what it is? No. Yes, no, some, some yes, some no. So this is a recurrent neural network. I think it's exactly, very, very simply put what it is. Okay? It's a network that takes itself as an input and goes through a sequence. And since sentences are sequences, that's kind of a perfect model to, to look at sentence, as, as sequences. So this is a, a recurrent net, for example. You have an input. Okay? It goes in, in the model. In the model, it predicts some features, H. And these features are used for predict. So this is a super normal model. It can be your CNN, if you want. But you have this, which is more, which is the fact that this feature becomes the input to the next step of the sequence. So you have the first word going in, get, becomes feature. You can predict if you want the next one. And then the next time, you have the input plus this feature, and you predict the next, and so on. OK? Right. Good, but the natural question that I hope you are having in your head right now is how does it work? Very nice, but that's a bit vague. Can you be more precise? Which, which part of this is complicated for you? Uh-huh. Okay, that's a good question, but it's not the one I'm fishing at, but I will still answer it. Um, so the story is that every time you get a word in, it gets processed, and the feature passed to the next, and to the next, and to the next, and at the last word of your sequence, basically, you have a representation that knows about the whole sentence. So you basically propagate information through every step of the sequence, and you use the last one for the final prediction. I think that was good. Yeah. Good. You, you, you have this without looking at the next slide? No, I didn't the the fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. This is what I was trying to fish for you. It's not strange for you that, you know, we have these words and magically they become features. Do, do we want to talk about that magic? I think it's nice, no? So, break. The thing that that it's strange in all this is how we use words in neural networks because neural networks, I, as our friend has said, what's, what's your name? Roberto. Roberto. As Roberto has said, neural network likes number and words are letters, no? So we need a way to go from a word to a feature vector. So just imagine this is a feature vector and the colors are positive and negative numbers, okay? And every little bar is one feature in your vector. You want to have what we call an embedding, good word, embedding. And this embedding basically defines a space, a vector space, where every point corresponds to a word. And it's not just any random points, every random embedding. We want an embedding that is semantic, because the words are semantic, OK? The, the, word, the space of words has meaning, because language has meaning, OK? So we want, for example, that, you know, men and, and women, which are relating to people, they need to have similar embeddings in that space. And they must be more similar than video camera. Eh? They should be close to television and things like that. So we want these embeddings to reflect our understanding of the word in semantic terms. OK? So there has been a lot of research about it, uh, to how to move from words to embeddings. And uh, a model that is pretty much known is called word to vec And I, I'm going to talk about it for a second. And then transformers, so in the next part of, of the course, uh, they learn their own. They just learn everything end to end, because they are monsters. And so, yes? That's exactly the next slides, yeah. <laughs> so how one, so you can either use a method that exists like word to vec So word to vec is an embedding method that has been trained before you, and you take the words, you pass them into word to vec you get a, a vector. Or in a transformer, it starts randomly and it learns it. it it's part of the learning process. OK, so word to vec <coughs> if, if I lose you, please tell me, eh? because we're, we're here to, for you. So if you're lost, just raise your hand. Oh, scream or cry, or whatever. <laughs> OK, so in word to vec 
the thing that you want to do is that you want to understand context, okay? We have seen that we want the, these embeddings of the word to be meaningful and to be uh, related to sentence, okay? So basically, in word to pack we try to find this embedding of a word given the context, okay? And we look at the context before and after the word. Why? Because if, if the only context you had was, I was hit by A, you probably will not reply in red, right? You're probably hit by a bus, which fortunately is the last, the, the following word. But if you have bus in London, it's probably red, because buses in London are red, right? So you have context, but context can be before or after the word you are looking at. So basically, you take your, each word you want to describe, and you give it a context that it is how it is observed before and after in your sentence, okay? So the word red gets these four entries in your, in your data set, and then you go on the bus, and bus says these words in your data set. So you basically construct a very long data set where every word gets related to the words that happen before and after, okay? Good. Now, when you have this, you set a learning task, which is predicting whether a combination appears in your data set. It's like self-supervised learning, you know? You have the sentences, you know the positions. See, when they co-occur, you say one. When they don't co-occur, you say zero. So it's very much like self-supervised learning, actually. Okay, so in our case, we know that red and bus co-occurred, uh, bus in, in Sion, they co-occurred in my corpus, and this is my training set. Okay, and the thing that we do is that we will find this vector space, eh? we will find this embedding space that will give us one vector per word, and while learning, we will try to have an embedding that when you compare red and bus, it gives you a high score, and when you compare red and tacos, it will give you a low score, because red and tacos do not occur very often in my imaginary data set. Okay, so it's really contrastive learning, if you think about it, it's totally contrastive learning. Okay, you follow me? You look for a vector space where similar things are similar and dissimilar things are far. Okay, now we have a problem. We have only positive examples. So how do you learn a classifier if you have only positive examples? Yes, you should embed some negatives. Any idea how? Yeah, don't think about uh, difficult stuff. You just, you know, you... No, too far. Now you do... Ah, oh, this is interesting. Okay, I'll stop using the pointer because it doesn't like me. Here we go. Uh, so yes, you just add negative example by randomly sampling word. Okay, sometimes you, you will get a word that co-occurs, but the probability is very low because your corpus is very big. Okay, so now you have positive, you have negative, you can train a classifier. That's good. So you have your matrix that you want to learn. This is the embedding matrix, okay? Let's say this line corresponds to the word red. And then you have a, another matrix for the context, which uh, at the beginning is the same and then it will, it will diverge. And every line is a word, and of course the same line corresponds to the same, to the same word. And now you start extracting words and comparing embeddings, which means that you take the, the embedding of red, the embedding of bus, you know that the label is one because you know they co-occur, then you, you take red and firefly and you know that they never co-occur and red and tacos, they never co-occur, okay? How do you calculate the, the score? You basically multiply these two and they will give you, the, their dot product will give you a number and then Believe it or not, you pass it in a sigmoid, so it goes between zero and one, and you subtract it from the label, and this gives you the loss. As simple as that. <laughs> and when you have it, you back propagate in the network, and you update your embeddings. And one iteration at a time, you end up on embeddings where red will be similar to bus and dissimilar from firefly and tacos. And this is word to back. Yes.
Of course, it has to do with attention, and we'll come to that in a second. Yeah, very good point. OK, so now you know how to make this. And the rest I have already explained, because I had the question from you. And <laughs> so remember, we take a word, we convert it to a feature vector using word to vec or your favorite one. And when you have this, it's a feature entering a neural network, makes a prediction, and then you take this last fully connected layer, if you want, and you pass it on as an input. So the next step will take the word to vec vector, stack it with the fully connected vector of the previous step, and they both are used to predict this word. Same here. And at the very last one, we'll, uh, you will use for the final prediction. OK? Cool. Sure? Yes? Uh, so very good question. Um, so there is always a first token, which is start of sec sentence. It's the only the, always the first one you use. And uh, the recurrent neural network goes only in one direction. And this is why, this is the biggest difference with transformers, actually. Because transformers attend everywhere, while the, the recurrent neural network just goes from the beginning to the end of the sentence. And basically, you will predict the probability of cat as an output, and then you try the probability of firefly as an output, and you will take the one with maximum probability. OK? Nice. So let's make a remote sensing related example because of course you're here for remote sensing, I know. Uh, so this is, this is a paper uh, I did a long time ago, actually probably the last, last thing I did as, a, <laughs> as an active uh, first author thingy. <laughs> and, um, and we were basically predicting clouds from a time series of, um, of, uh, of thermal infrared images from Maris. And uh, we had one image every 15 minutes, if I remember well, and the idea was to predict a cloud map. Okay? What does this have to do with language, you will say? <laughs> Legitimate question. But just imagine that every element of the time series is a word. Okay? You have a sequence of words, which is a sentence, can be a time series of images. I mean, it's the same. Right? You can use the same technology. So here, basically, what I was doing is that I was taking the image, putting it in, into a CNN, extracting some features, and then all together, stacking everything in what we call a hyper column. We were talking about it yesterday. Yeah? So you have the original image, you have uh, your different feature you have extracted, and then you go with a fully connected layer and predict your cloud map. That's just a CNN. I mean, I'm not telling you anything very new. But here, you have your score map, your logit, if you want, for every pixel, and we will put them back as an input for the next time step. Okay? And in that case, the model will learn from the image and what it knows from before. And that keep predicting, and every time it will get here, make a prediction, pass it on, then predict the next step, pass it on, and so on and so forth. So if you unroll this, so this is, this is like a compact version of it, but if you unroll it, it means that you have your image at time two. Of course, you don't have the previous prediction, so you just fill it with zeros or whatever you want. You put it in the CNN, it predicts. This becomes the input. Next time step, you predict. Tuck, goes here, goes here, and you go. Okay, that's a recurrent neural network just unrolled for you. And at every time step, you will have a prediction. Okay, and at every time step, you will pass on information for the next one. Because if there is a cloud here, 15 minutes later, there will probably be a cloud here. Let's just be clear. Yes? Because you pass information across time. It, it's a kind of a regularizing effect, if you think about it. Uh, because it's a, it's a process that is smooth in time. And the temporal lag is small enough that the, the cloud will move. but. Here it was 15 minutes, yeah. So it's like meteorological satellites, so they just keep taking the same area over and over again. And uh, with 15 minutes, you, you're pretty sure the cloud will have moved, but will still be more or less in the same region. So you, it helps you. Of course, if it was a day, useless. We agree, <laughs> yeah. Cloud 
Numerically, I mean, if numerically you have better performance and cloud masks of all, I mean, don't make me <laughs> speak poorly of cloud masks. You know they are quite inaccurate, especially at the interface between land and oceans. So these are the ways, the places where you want to have a, I mean, match is a big word, it works better, yeah. <laughs> okay, and in the end, so your, our loss was a loss, combining all the time steps. That's, that's how you learn your RNN. If you don't have the, the ground truth at every time step, you will use only the last, um, the last time step, which is what sometimes happens, but in this case, we had the ground truth every time, so it was kind of, kind of um, for free to use a combined loss where you put maximum weight on the, on the last time set and then smaller and smaller weights. So, oh, uh, what have I done? Okay, good. So RNNs conceptually work very well, but they have a problem that is written on the slide, but look at me, don't look at the slide, oh, just give it up, no slides. They have a problem of memory, okay? Remember, everything flows like this, and everything flows back in back propagation the same way. So you go, you go forward like this, and backwards you go one step at a time, back propagating through the sequence, okay? This means that to update the weights here, it's, it's gonna take a long time for the gradients to get there. Actually, you will be very good updating the gradients here, but here there is basically no, no information anymore. So you can get away with it with a number of tricks, you can you know, copy the weights across time, things like that, but it is true that if your sequence is very long, like if you have a, I don't know, 100 time steps you want to buff propagate into, after 10 there is nothing left, okay? Which means that uh, the, the, the vanilla RNN model I, I presented, it's not the one that is most used in the recurrent model. And um, just for your reference, I think I need to speed up a little bit. <laughs> but um, one, one model that uh, took a lot of importance, let's say, until a couple of years ago, until Transformers, to be clear, was what we call an LSTM. LSTM, who has heard about it? Good, 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 good. Oh, half of you, easy. So an LSTM is basically an RNN on steroids. There's a question? Have you heard? No. So it's, la it's actually an RNN on steroids. Uh, it's uh, Schmiduger, yeah, we have heard of him, <laughs> who back in the day proposed this <coughs> with Ochenreiter, and they, basically uh, try to solve this problem in RNNs by adding a solution for the memory issue. Which, there we go again, yeah. Which is that not only you will propagate the features through time, so this is the, this is the RNN, no? You have a time step coming in, the feature from the previous one, you pass it on, you predict, you go on, you pass it on, you predict. What they did in the LSTM was to add another stream here they will not depend only on the previous elements in the sequence, but from all the sequence. So it will, you will kind of accumulate information and keep that information. So that we, when you buff propagate, this reaches much easier earlier states. It's like a skip connection, if you want. Yes? So, uh, skip in it's like a skip connection in ResNet. It's calculated differently, because it takes all the time, the information of the previous time step, but the idea is like a skip connection. Uh, up, up, up. So here is with the example, you know, the I follow the cat because I always use that. And uh, so you start with followed, it goes in, then you have the probability of following given I, then you, you enter the, so you have the probability of the given I and followed, and then we cut. Ah, what have I done? You have the probability of cat given I follow the. Okay, that's, that's how it works with our cat problem, I, I hope you like cats. I do like love cats, like everybody in computer vision should. <laughs> All right, so uh, the, tri the trick was exactly that. So you have this, this C vector that actually will go through the model and accumulate information from before and from the current state, okay? While the H vector just depends on the previous one 
it gets in, and it predicts. And that's everything you need to know about the LSTM. If you want to know more, there are more slides in the, in the PDF, and you can check those ones, but I just didn't put them here. Is, is this clear? I know I'm making a jump, but it's for the sake of transformers. Yeah, all good? Nice. Ah. <laughs> but this is, then we have half an hour to discuss to answer this question. <laughs> Look at the extra slides, yeah? Okay? Cool. <laughs> nice. Uh, so, basically, the LSTM took the RNN and added this, this memory vector C that allows you to propagate information back, back in the past, okay? So, as for the RNN, you go one word at a time, and what you do is that you update your long memory vector, and then you estimate the current vector to make your prediction, and then you pass them both to the next word. So basically, it's very similar, despite what Schmidt Uber tries to convince you of. <laughs> and uh, all this, this different weight match, the different computation of the gates, so which means uh, this gate, this gate, and this gate, they all have matrices that are made of learnable parameters. So you have matrices to ways to learn by the neural network, and that's where the learning happens. Okay? They all multiply either the input or the hidden vector. How are these things trained? I mean, that's probably a, a good question to ask. So in a way, uh, in the language world, what, they, what we do is that we, do, we have a big text corpus, okay? So uh, for example, um, the skip thoughts model was uh, learned on book corpus, and book corpus is basically a collection of free ebooks. You know, in machine learning, we're very good at getting whatever is free and making models out of it. You can, you can be pro or against this, this procedure. Let's not start talking about ethics, but you know, all big models of this time are learned on whatever was grabbable on the internet. And in this case, it was a collection of free books, so basically, you train the RNN in a supervised way, or maybe self-supervised, because you don't have actual labels, but you, you use the corpus as a label. So a recurrent neural network like standard, what you do is that you predict the next word, okay? And the next word, you have it because you have the text, okay? So you just extract random sequences from your text up to a certain word, and you predict the probability of the next. And you learn until you get it right. And uh, in the case of skip thoughts, which was a, a version uh, that we used in our VQA uh, models that I will show you in the second part, um, it was learned with a task that is a little bit more tricky, which is given a certain sentence, you need to predict the next one and the previous one, or the previous one and the next one. I don't remember who it was. So basically, you let the RNN going, so it keeps predicting, and you get here, and you make sure it predicts the right word. So it's a really a long-term prediction task, because you want it to be actually good at following the prediction task. So you're not, you're not predicting only the, the next one, but you, you just keep going. OK? So these are two ways. So you see, if you go back to the self-supervised cur course of Mike Michel, I hope you talked about it, but I'm sure you did. Uh, you craft labels the way you can, OK? So here, you basically make your data the labels. There is no annotation necessary, you just need the text. Right? Are you alive? And now the difficult part starts. Up to now, walk in the park. <laughs> so who has been playing with transformers? Don't be shy, don't be shy. And it's fine to say no, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> Transformers, this is uh, something you cannot ignore if you want to stay in the deep learning business now. So I'm happy that I am the person giving you the gentle introduction. And I hope it's gonna be a good one, let's see. So it's a business that goes very fast. Let's start with that, so this, are transformer models around, I mean, language models, let's say, not just transformers. Uh, 
so these are the large language models in March 2023. Okay? You see there is a lot of them. Today, which one do you want to do? Come on, which one? Do? I like the Bible one, Jurassic. You want Jurassic, okay. Who, want, who wants another? Galactica. Galactica. We're gonna train it on my machine. What do you think? Yeah. So the, the size of the, um, of the bubble is proportional to the number of parameters of the model. So uh, Jurassic, which Sylvia liked, has 178 billion parameters. Okay? And Galactica, where is Galactica? Here. 120 billion, so it's a small one. It's okay, yeah. <laughs> Today we talk about this. Okay? Today we talk about BERT. For a number of reasons. Because it's simple to explain. <laughs> Secondly, because this is something that potentially you can tune yourself. Okay? Forget about those. Th this you can take, pre-train, you can take the weights, and go. Okay? But at EPFL, I, we don't have the compute to reproduce palm. In all my university, there is no, not enough compute. So, yeah. BERT is okay. BERT, you can do it in, if you have a good machine and a good time. And sometime, it's something you can play with yourself. And, um, you know, all, all, all these guys are fine. But you see, even the GPT ones, you know, chat GPT, I'm sure you heard about it. Um, maybe not GPT-4, but, you know, 3 and 3.5. That should be somewhere in here. But I can find it. Ah, where are you, GPT? On the left, help me, help me. So this is this is one version of GPT-3 and ah here 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 there you go GPT-3 tough huh? GPT-3 big, big big big. You don't want to train it yourself. Anyway, so just to tell you this this gentle example was to tell you that it goes. There's a lot of people working on that. There's a lot of compute put into that, and it goes very 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 fast. Chat GPT November last year. It seems like it has been here forever. It's less than a year old. Yes. I mean, it's one metric, yeah. The amount of data used to train them also differs. Yeah. No, it's, no, it's different every time. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know the details of all of them by far. And for many of them, nobody does. <laughs> But okay, that's another story. Uh, Bert, I can explain you. That's like you know, open and public, and you can get the code, and and that's okay. Okay, <clears throat> so if you are uh, on Twitter and you follow things about language model, you will realize that new lang large language models are proposed every day, basically. So, I mean, it's, it's tough to keep up with the literature, and uh, so you need to focus on things that are useful for your research. And you know, in remote sensing, you probably don't need. Uh, 200 billion parameters models, so you know you cannot you can live very well with something of a small size, but that you can control. Okay, so that's my rationale to choose in BERT. Uh, if you wanted to know everything about GPT-3, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, but it's not today. Uh, otherwise, um, I want to get you to BERT, but before getting you to BERT, I need to talk about transformers because otherwise we're missing out on the on the basics. Uh, do you want to make a break, maybe? Or I know I'm at the start it later, so I can, I can maybe go a little bit more. Yeah, no, because that's a big chunk of the, of the presentation. Fair enough. I mean, you tell me when to stop and we stop. Yeah. Eleven sharp. Okay, you tell me. Good. So transformers. Yeah. That's where you laugh. That's so funny. No, no, no. Oh my god, I'm too old for that. Okay. What was that? Amazing. <laughs> Good. So it's, um, if you haven't heard about it, you probably have been living under a rock, which is fine, but it's time to get out of the rock now and learn about transformers. Okay. Uh, so transformers are neural networks. They start there. And they are neural networks with a very, very specific 
uh, infrastructure, archi architecture, which looks like that. And this is very scary, right? right? In most presentations, people will tell you, this is the transformer, let's move on. <laughs> but to, not today, because I'm, I'm crazy and, uh, and I decided to you know, give you a little bit more for your money, uh, which is basically going into the different parts uh, on a very high level, uh, don't worry. But still, let, let's try to bring something home uh, with this. Okay, if you want to really go on the step-by-step -step thing that explain you all the details, the illustrated transformer is a fantastic um, resource. That's what I use to make this slide. So I, I'm guilty, I tell you, I use those slides. <laughs> but okay, so the transformer looks very complicated, okay? But basically, it's not so complicated because ah, it's made of two big chunks, okay? Left chunks, an encoder, right chunks, a decoder. But don't get started with, oh, it's an old encoder. No, 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 no. it's much more than that, okay? <laughs> But the structure is this, you know, first encode information, and then you decode to uh, do your predictions on the sequence. Every time you enter some, um, some text here, and you get some encoders, they get into the decoder when you will pass each word one by one and predict the next word, okay? This happens in the decoder, and the encoder basically learns all, all the matrices and the relations between the words, okay? So this seems overly simple, it's not, of course. Let's start here. It's not just one encoder. It's like six encoders in and six encoders out. And six is a magic number. Eh? Depending on the transformer, you can have more. You can have 10, 12, whatever. Okay? The good thing for you is that at least, thank to God, they have not been played with the, the, the architecture of each encoder. They're all the same. Okay, so it's a copy of the same encoder. So each encoder gets the previous one as an in the output of the previous one as an input, process it more, pass it to the next, to the next, to the next. You know, it's like the good old ResNet 152 debate. Yeah, you put a lot of layers because ah, you learn more complex functions. Okay, good. So this is how it works. Uh, you have six encoders, six decoders. They're all connected together in a way, uh, usually, forward, here forward, and the output of the last encoder is the input of the first decoder. Okay? Good. So the first thing that you need to do when you have a transformer is called tokenizing. Tokenizing? So, good. Tokenizing is very simple. Tokenizing is basically what happened in every NLP model, also in the RNNs uh, we saw before. Basically, you have a sentence, you convert it into tokens. Every token, it's a bunch of text, okay? It can be a word, it can be you know, a punctuation mark, things like that. Every single token has a number, and it's always the same, okay? So every time hello appears, it has the same token. And this connects to a dictionary where you have your embeddings, okay? So that everybody, the word hello appears, you know that you, ne you need to take this vector here, all right? So if you want an example, we can go back to the Jupyter Notebook here on the tokenizer. And basically, we have here a bunch of texts where we say, using a transformer network is simple, the network is, okay? You pass it in the tokenizer, you can, you can execute it if you want. And basically, first, you divide into tokens. It's like using a transformer. So here it decides to split into two because he has the word trans and the word former into two split tokens. Uh, network is simple. The comma is a token. And then the network is. Okay? You split the sentence into chunks. Okay? And then you encode each token into a number. Okay? And these are your IDs. So you see, using is 7993, and then you have all the numbers. The only thing is that they played smart, and I put the, the word network twice. So as you can see that network is 1110 in our dictionary. It means that it is the 1,110th row in your, in your dictionary, OK? And each, each column is a, is a feature, OK? That's it, as simple as that. 
back to the slides. You have questions? I mean, you can always interrupt me. Yes. 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 Exactly. Yes. Attention is all you need. This one is at all uh, 2019. <laughs> they decide 512. People use 512. Other transformers have other dimensions. It's a number. It's, I mean, it's as unsatisfactory as this. <laughs> I'm sorry. And um, yeah, also the size of the dictionary depends on the study. You know, sometimes you have dictionaries of 50,000 words. BERT is like 30,000 words, if I remember well. Uh, the bigger the dictionary, the more words you have to play with. Yeah. And since the transformer learn their own embeddings, they're not bound to anything else. Like the word to vec we saw before, it's, a, it's an encoding of a given size because it has been trained for a certain size. So if you want to use word to vec as an encoder, then it needs to be of the same size. Like I don't have it in my mind right now, but like glove is 300 dimension, word to vec must be 600 or something. And um, so the, 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 the length of this vector de will depend on the length word to vec give you. But since the transformer just starts with random numbers and learns this embedding in the learning process, it can be basically any dimension you want. Okay? Thanks. Good question. Okay, so if you go back here, you have your words, they become tokens. Every token is a vector, okay? And then you use this vector as the input of your transformer. If you remember the structure before, you have six encoders piled up. So the first encoder will take the inputs, so your embeddings. The second one will take the, out the output of the first. So it's only the first encoder that will see those original embeddings. Okay? Nice. Now, there is another thing that it's a bit of a specificity of, uh, of transformers, is that <coughs> not only as an input you will pass the embedding vectors, but they will add what we call a positional encoding. Okay? A positional encoding is information about where in the sentence the word occurs. Okay? And it's just a vector that must be different all the time depending on the position. Why is that important? Because closed words sometimes influence the word more often. Far away words influence less. So when you calculate your attentions, you want them to be weighted by the relative position between words. And it's as simple as that. You have, a, you have your original encoding for these three words. Right? Je suis étudiant, if you speak French. Um, they correspond to three embeddings. And you just sum some numbers that are unique and depend of a single position. OK? So if we go back to the notebook. I need to find the positional encoders. Where are you? Oh, that's going to be much, much later. So they look a little bit like that. And basically, here I have mapped different positional encoders for different positions. So every row here is a different position in the sequence. So imagine we have a sequence of 100 words. Yeah? So every point here. It's a position. And then it's a, I think it's a 20 dimensional vector. And, uh, and basically, I'm mapping some of the dimensions. They are always combinations of sine and cosine functions. And for each position, it will give you different numbers. So, like the first word will get 1100, zero, zero. the second word will get you 09, zero, 09, zero, zero, one, zero, one, and so on and so forth. And all these positions are unique. Since they are unique, they allow you to identify the exact position of the word in the sentence. And that's the only job this has to do. Yes? So these are learned by the no. It's probably the only thing that is not learned in a transformer. They, are, they need to be static because they will tell you where the word is in the sentence. It's the only job they're doing is to tell you, oh, this is the fifth word of your sequence. Nice. Uh, be back. Okay, so what you learn, I mean, they are, they are not learned per se, but all this package is learned together, you know? 
but this part that you sum it's fixed, and this part you learn. OK, good. Well, now you, we, we basically have everything we need to start talking about transformers. So basically, we have our inputs. Yeah? This is probably something you have in your mind now <laughs> after one hour and a half with me. Yeah? Oh, I hate it so much. And these words correspond to these tokens here, okay? plus these two magical numbers, 101 and 102. What are they? Good. Beginning and end of sentence. Always there, huh? important, because they are used by the transformer to know where to start and where to end. Good. And then uh, you have what we call an attention mask, but that's not very important at this point. Then we have the input embeddings. Eh? You can decide to use randomly initialized numbers. You could say, okay, let's use word to vec at the start, and then improving it while learning. That's up to you. You can choose. And the third ingredient is positional embeddings who come here, and that's basically something that tells you where the word is in the sentence. With these three inputs, we can start learning. Okay? They're just a sum of the three. Nice? Okay. Now, let's go in the encoders of the embeddings, uh, of, the, of the transformer. So there are six of them, they're all identical. So I explain you only one. Okay? <laughs> so all of, all of them, they take the input em embeddings, they put them into a layer called self attention. Thanks to the self-attention, they create some vectors called zeta. There is one vector per word, as you can see, and each word goes its own way in the transformer. Eh? They are related via the self-attention. And after this, they all go through into a feed-forward neural network because we can make things more complex. If we can, we do it, right? So, and then what, what comes out here becomes the input of the next encoder. And again, and again, and again, six times in the original transformer. OK? Good. So the, the, the funny bit is, of course, the self-attention module. That's where the magic happens. And um, so what is self-attention? I think this is the, the important bit. It's a way to relate each word to all the other words in the sentence, in the sequence. OK? When we talked about RNNs, I don't know who asked the question, um, we, we said, the RNN goes one word at a time in the forward direction, okay? So, takes, oh, jumpa, no es tai. Dopo, dopo, dopo. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, let's go back. So, the, the, the recurrent neural network takes one word at a time and it always goes in the same direction. It means that when you are considering the word it, you only have access to these words, because you never saw what happens after, okay? The difference of the transformer is that you use self-attention that relates every word to all the others. So in a way, the transformers sees all the sentence from the very beginning, okay? Which helps you actually relating. You remember the example of the bus before? It's good to have context before and after to model a single word. Okay? And this is what self-attention does. Basically, it tries to find these weights. So every line here is an attention weight. And the, the strength of the color depends on how related two words are. So in, in this case, it is related to the animal. It do, is not related to the street. If you read the sentence, uh, I mean, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired, it is obviously referring to the animal. But the only way to know is Thank you, that's a, a nice, nice way out, but let's be a bit more precise. I mean, it grammatically could be the street or the animal. Why did it, does it choose the animal? Come on, you just need to read the sentence. It's not a very difficult question. <laughs> Come on. Let's read it together. The animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. Who was tired, the animal or the street? The animal. But if you don't know the end of the sentence, you cannot tell, 
right? So you need to look before and after the word. Because without this, there's no way you can know if, I mean, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too crowded. Then it's the street, it's not the animal, yeah. So it depends on what happens here. This is why you need to attend to all the sentence to make like proper predictions, okay? In this attention layer, focus on the animal. Later we will see other attention layer, layers will focus on the rest. Okay, cool. So this is the, the probably the only slide with uh, heavy maths. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but basically, this is how the self-attention works, okay? You will take your input, so your embedding of a word, and you will pass it into the self-attention layer. And the self-attention layer, in a nutshell, is made of two things. One is the feature of the word itself, and the other is some weights that will depend on the word itself, query, and all the others. The, uh, the key, as a, no, uh, yeah, the, the key is all the others, yeah. So basically, you will compute your attention as a multiplication of the two, where V is the, is the features of all the words in your sequence, and the rest is some weights you will apply to see how important these other words are with respect to the word you are actually looking at. Okay? And it's a very, I mean, it's a very simple matrix multiplication. Eh? And again, in the slide, you have all the steps one by one to get to this formula. But for the sake of time, I decide to, to skip it. Otherwise, we will never make it to the end. <laughs> Just remember this very high level uh, idea is that you want to find for each word a combination of all the rest that depends on the feature of these words and some kind of weighting scheme. Okay? And this will give you one number per word. I mean, one feature per word that will tell you how important that is. So this is a kind of an illustration of it. So you have this, uh, these weights, we were talking about it, eh? which is basically the relations between the words you are looking at, Q here, you're looking at the, the second word in the se sequence, and you're multiplying this vector with all the others, okay? So it will tell you, in a way, the relation between this word and everything else, right? Then you pass it through a softmat, so it's between zero and one, it's a weight, remember? And when you have this that is passed into zero and one, you will multiply it for every single word with their own feature, which is this value V, okay? So for word two, you will compute this multiplication and it will give you a new feature vector for word two, okay? And then you move on to word three and you do it again. And you do it for every single word in your sequence. This is why the, the, the transformer module considers every word by, by, one by one and it makes the connection between words in the self-attention module. Okay? Does it work? Maybe it's a good time to stop so you can think about self-attention during the break. And I'll see you after in half an hour. Yeah. Yeah, it comes after the break. You know about Transformer, I see that. 